it is fraudulent because the the person who's numbering the card, you, you just exactly, you said it exactly right. They're trying to extract value and they're trying to trick the person into buying something else. It's no different. It's no different than forging artwork. It's the exact same thing. It's, um, it's the exact same process. So, you know, the question that I've been asked in the past is, you know, what should we do about uncut sheets? Because they are out there. They are really cool. Between you and I, we paid about a hundred grand for two uncut sheets, you know? So, I mean, clearly they got, you know, they've got a lot of value. Um, you were the vast majority of that, uh, of, of that hundred grand, by the way. But I've had people ask me this and they've said, you know, what do you think, what do you think should be done if somebody wants to cut up, to cut up the, the, the sheets? And, you know, I, I think it's a fair question and I think everybody has different feelings on this. Welcome to another episode of The Hobby. I'm your host, Adam, and I'm joined today by the one and only Spinatron. Today, we have some absolutely huge and very important uh, information to share and to talk about. You might have seen a little bit on Instagram in the last week on Essential Credentials Now uh, uncut sheet uh, that was that was cut and uh, that the cards were serial numbered and then later graded. Got a lot of information to share on this and we're excited to do that. But before we get into, into it too much, Spino, I just want to ask you, how are you doing and how are you feeling post sort of everything that we learned over the last few days? Um, yeah, I, I feel a little bit disappointed that um, because I, I saw the sheets in the auction, right? So I, the thing I do is usually I try to win it, but recently there are quite a few of them. So I try to win the rare ones and let pass the future version. And then the minute I let it pass, it becomes sheet card and uh, with the after job stamps and the create some um, artificial dilution and uncertainty. So, but I think you did a great job with the Instagram video, which sort of um, dispel this whole thing. And uh, I think we're back on track. Yeah, I think in this episode, hopefully we dive into a little bit more and uh, clarify uh, some uncertainties. Yeah, well, we're going to dive in real deep on all of this stuff because it's such an important, really vitally uh, important topic um, that I know is important to both you and I. But as you as you just said, um, you know, we've seen several sheets. We didn't see any of these uncut sheets for years. Um, and then between a couple of different au auction houses, we saw three uncut uh, essential credentials now sheets. I'm uh, sorry, three future sheets, forgive me, and one essential credentials now sheet. You uh, fortunately were able to pick up the essential credentials now sheet uh, a couple of months ago. And a little over a year ago, I picked up one of the, two, one of the three future sheets. Those two sheets we know are safe because I own it and you own yours and I know where mine is. I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you know where yours is. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. It will so, be forever to get off the market. So it will be, yeah. And the reason that's, that's the reason that's important is, is what you just said. They're forever off the market, meaning that they no longer can be taken and cut and, and, and serial numbered, right. And have somebody try to pass them off as pack, old cards. The disappointing thing though, is that left two future uh, essential credentials, future sheets um, that are, th that's the pink and purple sheet that are both uh, out. And we, we don't know who, who purchased both of those. What we do know is that the, sh the, the, the complete set is actually two different sheets. There is um, a, a version that has Kobe and Michael Jordan on it. That's the one that we've seen three different times. And then the other sheet actually has some of the rarer cards in the set. And we haven't yeah, seen, yeah. say that again. Uh, T-Mac and Mercer on the other, other sheet. Yeah. That's right. Um, <laughs> Ron Mercer out of one. And um, and some of those other guys, Duncan is really low numbered on, on, that, on that side as well. And so we haven't seen, we haven't seen the one that has the, the future set that has like the rarer rookie cards, but we've seen three of the same one that, that's, you know, that's half the set. So really what happened last Friday is um, I was 
conducting a search, looking for credential cards as I do all the time. I love the credential set. And so I often search for these cards and I saw something that was really surprising. I saw five 1997, 98 essential credentials, future cards of five pretty big players um, that had just popped up at open auction and they were all uh, graded by Beckett with no subgrades on them. This stood out to me for a lot of reasons. One, you never see this many essential credentials listed at one time at open auction. They're just very rare cards. You never see any in open auction and you get excited about it. So to see five of them at the same time was really exciting. But to see five that were graded by Beckett with no subs is where really like um, a red flag popped up because you're just not going to see cards like that graded without subs very often. So when I saw that, I said the same thing that you probably did, Spino. I thought, you know, this, this could be, these could be from one of those uncut sheets. And so I pulled up the auctions of those uncut sheets, of, of the, those sheets that we didn't know, you know, that we didn't know where they were, the ones that we didn't know the location of, I should say. And we were able to basically photo match the, the idiosyncrasies on the sheet with the cards that were available. And then um, another part of this giveaway is that all five cards that were available were on one sheet, not on the other one. They were all on the single sheet. And so as, as we did this, we sort of like went back and forth and I messaged you when I messaged you this detail, do you remember what kind of what your reaction was and what you looked for? Yeah, I think um, I was kind of in my morning routine. I tried to get out to walk my dog and so on. And then, you mentioned about, um, I think I haven't got around to search on that day yet. You mentioned about those auctions. I, I take a look. I think uh, I get the sense that you, you seem to suggest it might be suspect, right? And then I check them. And um, the first thing I look at is some of the edges looks extremely curly because uh, back to version, although sometimes it's not perfectly straight, but it's not like as curly as, some of them, like for, for example, the cam on top is really, really curly. So it's kind of like a sheet cut. And then I check the back of the, the foil stamp and they are also not a very consistent nature. So it's, uh, we can get, it, get into it a little bit later, but it, it doesn't seem right, right? And then, yeah, so I, I okay, I, I was very shocked that uh, this immediately happened and then and then I think I was uh, about to go on, go on vacation and uh, right. And then you, you went on to, to kind of identify where it came from. We, we, we originally planned to do something together, but uh, I think you get, get a message out at first opportunity, which is good, I think, so that guys are informed at a, at a very early stage so that they know that they won't get scammed by the email offering. Yeah, it was important. We wanted those auctions to end because we didn't we didn't want somebody to go spend a lot of money on something that wasn't what they thought it was. And by by the time that you looked at the edges being off and the serial number and you found the serial numbers were off and you know we had the photo match thing that was matched with one particular sheet that had been sold. And again, go you know go check out my Instagram at the real 27 guy to see that video. Um it all sort of added up to a situation where these cards were pretty clearly not original and pack pulled. And at the same time, we discovered that, you know, that there were five other cards that were up at that, at that same time from the same BGS submission, the same run of cards from um, that, that um, were also from a different, were from credentials, but from a different year. Do you want to talk about how you kind of figured out that those also were, were cards that had been, had been, this is, this is really key, had been cut and then serial numbered really fraudulently. Um, how could you tell that those also were not, were not real or authentic yeah. cards? Or sorry, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say in, uh, unauthentic because they came from real sheets from the FLIR bankruptcy, right? Like these were real, really made by FLIR. It's just that they were then taken and cut and serial numbered as if they were really pack pulled. And that matters to collectors a lot. And so, so maybe actually, maybe if you could talk first about why it's important that you're getting a real pack pulled um, 
you know, card rather than one that's sort of been may- maybe like um, taken and, and from an uncut sheet and then changed. <laughs> and then after yeah. you, and then after you do that, you can answer the other question. Yeah, great. Yeah. I think we, first we should know that uh, in the nineties era, right? I think the, the innovation is on the card itself. It's usually the pure card without any autograph or game used element, uh, most chaste, right? From Fleer and the Skybox. Um, they have innovation like titanium with the host drill through them or like special credentials with multiple materials layered and a very innovative like a numbering system, right? Um, but because of, I think um, the team arena design has told us that um, key part of the production process is get a printer who is able to produce those things and they take a several choice. And as you can see that from the pack put version, um, at least from 97, 98, the edges are very, can be chipped up, right? And sometimes things can be flaring up. Uh, even for all, like, for example, Keith Van Horn can have a fixed scratch on the acetate for all of them. So those kind of things, if your collector is very OCD, right, they would like to have a perfect copy because those are really hard to pull. I think some people estimate, like from the one case, you probably cannot even hit one um, internal credential. So if they somehow pull this thing, but somehow it's not perfect with the like edge messed up or acetate scratched up, so they can just mail this back to the a clear or a step box at the time and they will give you a replacement copy and the replacement copy was from a sheet like like we just talked about right That's they right. reserve some sheets for this purpose and as we have seen recently on instagram um david robinson essential credential now um i think two different users so i think um john Spur fanatic, right? And also Nas. Um, most of them has a David Robinson out of 18 from different sources. And both copies actually were replaced by Skybox at the time. And they have a letter saying, okay, with the, like the, your original uh, pack put version is cut up with the serial number stick to the letter saying, okay, this original has been destroyed and here is the new copy and the both looks very nice one is created by eight to two, two, eight right that's right so, so those uh, sheets were there um not meant to be leaked out or circulate but just there in their office to to kind of uh, replace if there is any uh, damage during the production or packing or the collector is not satisfied with the quality control so, but I think in, uh, as, as kind of the um, hobby evolves, right? Game use and auto becomes more prevalent. I think Exquisite, Automate, Upper Deck has like kind of new kind of game, right? To, to this hobby and uh, Fleer um, at that time was not able to keep up, I think. Um, they got an offer from Upper Deck and declined that. And uh, one year later, they filed bankruptcy and acquired by Upper Deck as a very tiny fraction of the offer back then. And that was around 2005, right? And all the assets are liquidated to the creditors. I think there's a, even a PDF documentary uh, document <laughs> online, right? With the inventory list, a ton of uh, sheets. Right? We. We did a we did a piece on that bankruptcy document mm-hmm. in Basketball Card Fanatic magazine, and it's really an important document because what it does is it details all of the things that went out into the world from Fleer, um, and some of which were things like desks and chairs and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah. but also one one thing that you learn from that that PDF is you learn how many you know how many uncut sheets went out. Now, unfortunately it doesn't detail which uncut sheets got out. Mm-hmm. The thing that yeah. I've always been nervous about is that somewhere along the lot, along the way, we would realize that a PMG green uh, uncut mm-hmm. sheet got out. 
Um, but not dissimilar to that, these essential credentials uncut sheets were, I mean, if all of the cards on a sheet had been packed, pulled, you know, especially from your now, your, your um, essential credentials now sheet, you're talking about millions of dollars in value because yeah. you're talking about the Michael Jordan and the Kobe Bryant that are numbered to, I think, eight and nine, um, you know, both of which are cards that are seven figure cards. I mean, they're just absolutely yeah. huge, huge value. And so the reason that this is so scary is that if you can have a sheet that pops up in 2022 that then gets cut and that those, then those cards have fake serial numbers added and, and it, and it actually like, it, it confuses people and people believe that those are real. Somebody basically could fraudulently cut the sheet and to the tune of millions of dollars. And somebody could be buying that and think that they're buying something that's pack pulled. It's not. I also, I also want to add to this, that the two cards that you mentioned from Instagram, the two Dave Robinsons, those are really an interesting case because both of those are from FLIR. And I don't know how you feel about this, Spino, but for me, if the card is sent from FLIR in its final version, so cut and stamped and whatever else, and it's sent by FLIR, to me, that's just as good as a pack pulled card as long as it's identical to a pack pulled card. So if they hand numbered the serial number, I wouldn't be good with that personally. But yeah. as long as it's actually stamped the same way, then I then I tip my cap to it and I say that's the same as a pack pulled card. But that is very different than somebody else who tries to do it. Because when somebody else tries to do it, that's not from, from FLIR. That's that's faking it. And that is really like to me like the dangerous sort of scary thing that we that we see out there right now. And what and what has happened here with these 10 essential credentials cards that we're talking about. Right. Yeah, I, I think what you mentioned is exactly right because when FLIR did the replacement process, right, it's official, right? Same machine and the same spec specification. And in issuing a replacement, they also destroyed original. So That's right. it's, uh, no extra copy created and same owner is rewarded by the replacement, right? But that gives you a like only the cut off serial number part to show this this copy has been destroyed the original copy so that's uh, absolutely fine in my book um, but in this case um, if some people acquire the sheets after the market and cut it up it's a uh, um, it's frowned upon because um, the the reason people are doing this is try to extract value from it right that's right um, I think sheets and even unnumbered um, cards from 90s, from those Skybox and Fleer, those were chased by collectors as some odd, odd, like odd items, oddity items, right? And, but they only pay tiny fraction of the value, probably five to 10%, sometimes 20% max, right? And then there are other people doing this. And also some people call it uh, artist proof or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's front upon, but it's not as serious, serious as you kind of temper the card, right? Adding the fake aftermarket serial number to portray the card as if it's pack pulled. That's basically fraud, right? Basically That's mail right. fraud, which can be persecuted, put into a jail <laughs> if the value is too high, I think. Well, it is. Yeah. It's it is fraudulent because the the person who's numbering the card, you, you just exactly you said it exactly right. They're trying to extract value and they're trying to trick the person into buying something else. It's no different. It's no different than forging artwork. It's the exact same thing. It's um, it's the exact same process. So you know the question that I've been asked in the past is, you know, what should we do about uncut sheets because they are out there. They are really cool. Between you and I, we paid about a hundred grand for two uncut sheets, you know? So, I mean, clearly they have, you know, they've got a lot of value. Um, you were the vast majority of that, uh, of, of that hundred grand, by the way, but I've had people ask me this and they've said, you know, what do you think, what do you think should be done if somebody wants to cut up, to cut up the, the, the sheets? And, you know, I, I think it's a fair question and I think everybody has different feelings on this, but I'll tell you what my thoughts are. And I haven't told you this before, so I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think. So remember slam bams, that's like one of the most popular um, 90s inserts it has Jordan it has Kobe, it's number to 100, but it's a it's a really like 
It's a really hard to find uh, insert card. So Slam Bams doesn't have any cards out there that I'm aware of that have ever sort of um, come forth from the bankruptcy. But what they do have is there are a couple of copies of the Slam Bams cards that have a hole punch straight through the card. And I love that because that to me, whether it was from the bankruptcy or, or it was a sample, I'm not sure. What's clear is you will never, you will never see that card and, and, you know, say, Oh, that was an original one that was out of a pack. No, because it has a hole punch through it. And there's no mistaking that. Um, I think that if somebody takes an original sheet and they say, I want to be able to cut this up and I want to be able to store it as normal cards, they go ahead and they put a hole punch straight through the card. I'm okay with that. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely one way, right, to kind of to show that this cannot be uh, further tempered with or try to put someone through, yeah. Uh, but I don't know, because for me, right, I complete the set after many years' effort. And to have a sheet next to it, I mean, it's only half of the sheet, right? Half of the sheet next to it. It's kind of a complementary piece, right? Um, on one hand, I kind of help the hobby by kind of preventing this circulate into the market. On the other hand, it's also kind of a piece of history back then, right? You can see like this is kind of one of the sheets that will eventually uh, put in circulation if some, something is damaged. So I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like... Um, <laughs> I think like you, you find uh, like, uh, for example, Mona Lisa's like uh, kind of understudy copy or something. And the, yeah. that's kind of a piece of history. And you put a punch through it just to ensure it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a right thing. I think, well, let me, let me just say, I own, I own the future sheet and I haven't cut the cards and I'm never going to, and I'm never going to put holes in it. However, if I was to cut the sheet, which I'm not going to again, if I was going to, I would want to ensure a way that no one could try to ever de deceive someone. And so that's how I would do it. That's what I would do. And I get why you don't like that. And I get why, you know, I get why you and I both are, you know, people who are holding our sheets because they're really cool as they are. But I guess I just, like, I think it's, it's really like, it's really scary to me that people are out there trying to do this. I, I don't want to say it's really scary. It's, it's concerning. You know, it's just a concern. I'd like to eliminate all potential of these fake copies ever being out there. And so I'd like for them to be destroyed. Um, the thing that the thing that ended up happening with these with these 10 credentials cards, they all got ended. You know, the consigner ended the items, but then the consigner then has to give those cards back, right, to the person who owns them. And what are they going to do? probably going to take them to a card show or they're going to do something else to try to pawn them off on somebody else who is unsuspecting. And that's where the, that's damage still can really be done there. You know? So yeah. um, I think, I think one go, of less, yeah, I think one of the less drastic way is to, for example, if someone were to cut, cut up the sheets, right. I think there are professionals who make a living just selling the sheets and the sheet cuts. I know like, but maybe not the so expensive or valuable cards. And yeah, they, because the sheets, they really sold for dirt cheap, right? If you get from the source. And the sheet cut, if the collector pay 5% of the real value is still a ton of money, Tons of money. right? Um, the problem with the fixed sample is like you go from 5% to the 100%, right? That's, That's right. problematic. Um, I think if, a conscientious individual is doing this. Maybe, I mean, it's a, this process is frowned upon in the hobby for sure. For sure. But probably not the criminal right activities. I think one way to do it is to make a really good scan of both sides and make it available on the, some database or on the forum. And also, when he sells it, he declares, "Yeah, this is a she cut," and. And people can just compare as you did photo match, right? To the given, yeah. like those documented copies. So that, that's one way to do it. Um, but uh, 
hole punch is uh, it's definitely one, one another, another way for sure. <laughs> I just want to be sure, you know. I want I want to be sure that it's unrecognizable. I thought about even like writing something on the back. Like, wouldn't it be funny if where the serial number was supposed to go, you, you wrote your name or something silly like that? But but people can wipe yeah, I think away one writing. of the Peter Manning part, one of Peter Manning essential credential, which the pipe pool version will be out of, um, I think, out of seven, right? Seven, and seven or nine. Top seven, right, seven. And it's pink version. And um, I, there's one option where people just write on the back, like in the ball pen, <laughs> like some zero number, <laughs> and they say it's replaced. And it's sold really high. It's sold much higher than the, like, untempered, unstamped version. So it's kind of people even buy that kind of thing. <laughs> well, yeah. Our friend uh, Michael Coleman has he's a big he's a big McGrady fan, right? And McGrady's card, yeah. you know, is number two. Yeah, you can't find. I know more story about this thing. I can talk about this a little bit. If you want. Well, well, I was. I'll just say. Um, well, yeah. You go ahead. Go ahead and go ahead and tell the story. I'd like to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Because I was kind of I was chasing this uh, T Mac, right? I know. There's a lead on the the legitimate version when uh, it's two out of two. Uh, that was available by one of the maybe I don't name the guy because I don't want to uh, any negativity associated to the person because sure. he did nothing wrong, right? He's a kind of big collector in several popular guys and all have jersey number cards or rare num rare cards, and he has the T Mac two out of two. And also two bankruptcy card from TMAC, but unnumbered. And they were uh, available in the, I think, 2011 national or 12. I think either one of those. And I was, I were trying to purchase the two out of two in person, but I arrived one day late and I was acquired by somebody. And it took me a lot of effort to eventually get that. But I know like those two bankruptcy unnumbered version was purchased by a, a car doctor. And he didn't do much research, right? Just stamped one, two, and two, two on it, which looks very comical. <laughs> it Even does. The, it, it, looks, I mean, it looks comical. The, the ones that he took <laughs> from the uncut sheets, they look comical because this, the serial number is so far from being the original. Right. That is, if yeah, you know the set, far. as soon as you see that bad serial number on on, on these two copies, these two, two McGrady ones that you're talking about, you know that they're fake. You know, you're sorry, yeah. you know that they were like, like happened here, that the, that the yeah. cards were cut from the sheet and that they were numbered by somebody else. But what's, what I think is really interesting about this is, so Mike, Michael Coleman, he, he really wanted one of these cards and he can't get the original. There's just no way to get a card out of two, right? You've got one and somebody's got the other one and neither one of you are, are ever going to sell it. And so he said, Hey, at least I have some way of getting the card, you know, even if it's not the right one, even if I know it's totally doc or like not a pack pulled card, at least I have some way of getting it. So like you say, they have some value still, even in an unnumbered, um, you know, version, but we're talking about 5% or, or 10%. It's not, it's not original. It's, or it's not actually pack pulled. Um, before we get too far away from it though, I asked you, how you were able to identify that the, oh, yeah. the, the five from 1998, <laughs> right. that those ones right. were were cut and, and stamped as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, yeah. And I, if you go to the golden auction, right, you can see like 97, 98, and the 98, 99 also have some like on oh. sheets offered, right? Yeah. And you can see what's exactly being offered there. And I think the same guy must have purchased both of the years and I think I was not uh, the, I would say I'm not the, the guy who actually spotted. I, I saw the serial number. I, I saw it immediately off because, for example, the Kobe is out of 81, right? The eight is completely off <laughs> without even compared to a legitimate old copy. When you, when, you say, another, yes, when you say it's off, when, when you say it's off, can you clarify real quick? What does that mean that the eight and 81 was totally off? Um, because if you, you can do some research by placing the two different cards, right? The, the zero number um, region of the cards close to each other. And you do the comparison and you try to tell like the differences 
And the first thing you check is whether the font of the, the digits, the figure or the letters are the same. They're completely not the same. And people, I think, I mean, not, some people don't have this kind of trained eyes, but for in this case, I think most people will be able to tell because yeah. they're really different font. Mm -hmm. But another Instagram um, guy sent me a DM saying, okay, the Kobe's kind of printed upside down. <laughs> Like basically, um, it should go. If you, I mean, at least for Kobe, right? If you turn the cards um, ninety degrees, um, let's see, counterclockwise, the the serial number should look exactly upright. But his his version is completely upside down. But I, so I made a very comical kind of post about it. <laughs> Spider Man tried to go upside down. <laughs> It's love interest. <laughs> I thought so I thought it was that was uh, immediately like uh, you can spot it. Anybody can say, okay, it's the wrong direction. <laughs> so. I thought it was a good catch, and and again, the fact that the fact that it was in the same group of serial numbers is important here because and this is one of the things you got to give uh, Beckett a lot of credit on a couple of things here. First thing you got to give him a lot of credit on is that they have dates on their on, on when their cards are graded. So. Um, in all cases, these cards were graded at the end of July, which interestingly is at the same time that the national card show is. My thought here is that, you know, somebody said, hey, I want to be able to get these in, into a slab. I want to find the best chance to find a, a grader at their busiest moment so that I can, you know, put it in under the lowest value. And then hopefully yeah, I can get these practice, passed through. Right. And I think that's what yes. they did. I, I think the, I think these guys were deceptive. I think they were really trying to be deceptive. And they went in on the last day of July, you know, at the national, and they said, "Hey, let's get these cards graded. Let's do it without subs." The thing that they did that's really interesting. That's a huge that that I think is why I caught onto it, and why I think most of us probably did is they graded them all at the same time. And so again, I think you got to give Beckett credit because if you take a serial number and I'm not talking about the serial number on the card. Now I'm talking about the serial number on the Beckett slab. You can take that number and you can just keep adding one to it, adding one to it. And you can see all of the cards in this whole section that were graded, all the credentials cards that were graded um, by this one submitter. And it's, you know, it's a good portion of that, of that sheet of those two sheets that we're talking about. And like, there's just like, there's very few people in the whole world that have many credential cards, right? You're one of them. Um, there's a couple of other guys that have more than say 10. Nobody has all of these raw copies that are just out there. And so, you know, the, the slabs they're in, these cards, they're actually an indictment on the cards at this point. You know that they came from, from, the, um, from the uncut sheets. You know that they were, were then later numbered and they're bad copies. But here's where we still have risk and why it's so important to do this episode, Spino. You know as well as I do, people can car break cards out of slabs. And so if some deceptive person says, I'm going to take these cards that are in these slabs now and I'm going to break them out and I'm going to go try to submit them somewhere else or do something else, that's where it gets really sticky. And so, you know, for me, the real take home here is you've got to do your research, whether it's in a PSA slab, a BGS slab. In fact, speaking of PSA, I forgot to mention you noted a you noted a card. I'm not sure if it's from the same sheet or not, but you noted a card recently that was graded by PSA that that appeared to have a bad serial number on it. Isn't that right? Right. I think the Pippin, right? I think there are, there were two versions of Pippin sold on eBay, which also very strange, right? Because Pippin you'd rarely see usually like uh, once every two years. It could be because of the the market is so high, so the the owners come out of the woodwork, try to cash it in. But so, so I just checked this tool, both are graded by PSA. And the PSA has a database, so they have the scan in. So both cards are under the same exact scanner. So you can compare, right? Because they are under the same condition. That's the most ideal situation to do some comp analysis. And one serial number is very consistent, uniform thickness in the foil stand and it looks perfect. The other one is, I think the, the first sign is that the backslash dash line is so long. And if you notice that, that, that's immediately wrong, right? And then all the foils are very flimsy. 
of inconsistent shine, like um, different depths, and also it just doesn't look right. So it's, I think I haven't really tried to identify where it comes from, but I think the, the foil stamp has a similar kind of inconsistency with the one just recently offered and canceled on eBay. So yeah. I think I think we shouldn't blame on the grading companies for this issue, right? Because it's kind of out of nowhere. And if they are not be particularly mindful of those, they could just grade a bunch of them, right? I think at the early days when the when some of uh, like the Thunder Super Rave came out, um, Thunder Rave, those are like one, one card per player max. It's super rare. Um, Kobe version, people didn't think it even exists. But then in a month, Becky graded 30 copies of it. That's right. TSA graded a bunch of copies of it. Uh, and it, it don't even like raise their alert level. So in this case, it's also because it's all, like, all of a sudden and both co company has failed to recognize um, some of the problematic serial numbers. So it's, it's more like, I think from this, maybe they will pay more attention and they should stop from happening, I think. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you bring up the raves because it's, it's an example of something that's happened for a really long time. Um, we, have, we have two different types of things that can happen. We have cards that are really like built from the ground up, um, you know, that where, where bad guys are basically creating the whole card down to the serial number and then getting those cards submitted and graded. That is not what is happening here with the credentials, right? With the credentials, it's the second thing where, where you've got an uncut sheet, real cards that were really made by FLIR. And, but, but it's still, again, it's not, I've heard people say, well, it's not that bad. Well, it's a huge deal. And to me where it's, to me where the, the very clear fraud comes in is the serial numbers. That's, that's the deceptive part. You know, we've, we've already, you know, we've already covered that a lot, but, um, but, you know, there, there's so many things to talk about here. You also talk about, you know, you talk about the graders. I do think it's really important to recognize that they've all gotten a lot of these things wrong over time. And so, you know, I think they need to improve, you know, I'm not going to just give them a free pass. Like they need to, they need to not let this sort of thing happen. But in the last couple of months, we've seen both PSA and Beckett make, make these mistakes. And so they both have to get better at it. Um, and the reality is, you know, post pandemic, everybody tried to move up after, you know, after the, you know, the boom of the market, a lot of people sold their, their less rare stuff. And now they're moving. A lot of people have moved into to nineties, right? I've got nineties cards that are worth more now than they were a year ago. And a year before that, like a lot of them have really just exploded in value. And so as people are going there, we have to make sure that people sort of have the recess, the resources at their hands to say, you know, what is right and what is not right. I'm sure you're like me. You get dozens of messages from people a week asking, you know, does this card look good to you? Does it not? It's really hard to answer all those questions as well as, as you'd like to, because there's so many people who are looking. You're always welcome to ask, you know, for sure, ask the ex experts. But what you really have to do is you've got to do in your own research. You know, you you need to figure out what the serial number is supposed to look like. You need to look at when the card was graded and if there have been any sheets that had been sold around there. You know, you, you've got to do that research. And, and rather than blindly throwing thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars at cards, do your research and recognize, you know, what, you know, what is what's real and what's not and, and what's been what's been um, you know, serial numbers that have been added and what haven't. And I, and in my experience is that if you do the research, you know, you're able to figure it out. So with all that said, the question that that really takes me to now is like, how do you think this, I'm going to call it a controversy, this experience, how do you think this affects how people, how will it affect how people view the essential credentials set? Right. Um, I think people should realize that for all the FLIR um, production, this issue will persist, right? That's right. So everything, almost everything we've seen has the bankruptcy version, right? And for example, we saw like football, PMG has serial number stamped out of 100, which is clearly a biased scammer who has no knowledge of hobby. 
And also Barclay has zero number out of a 150, right? So those right. are like the version that's being stamped, but without studying the set composition of the sets. Um, I think one should acknowledge that first. So that's part of the history, right? Because that's how they store um, the replacement version by sheets. And sheets got out during the liquidation in 2005. And recently, they all came out because of the hobby reached a different level, right? I think sheets used to be so really cheap. For example, I I had a chance to get a, like a PMG championship football sheets for like 3,000 <laughs> wow. for the entire set. That was uh, maybe 2000, early 2010s, right? Um, but at that time, I wasn't that into football, but I know that those things exist out there. So at that time, those are like still big money, I think <laughs> 3,000. So now probably 30,000 or more because the PMG championship is a big deal now. Um, the price level really high. I think um, why I kind of won the auction at 80,000, right? For the traditional now sheets. I think the reason is that I bet the underbidder calculated um, if they cut it up, there are probably around um, 10 or eight really valuable pieces in it, which can sell 10K easily, even without zero number. Mm -hmm. So that's why they beat at that amount. But uh, above that, they kind of uh, make their kind of this thing not worthwhile for them, probably. That's why. But yeah, so I think uh, that's one thing. So you, you have the knowledge this thing exists because of the situation. On the other hand, um, we don't have unlimited number of on-card sheets, right? They are really rare um, because I collected since 2009 and I, was, I did all the research prior to that. Basically, I read through all the hot pickings and uh, blow out forums, the entire forums. <laughs> so I know like uh, in the past, there's no... I mean, every sheets uh, have been counted for, right? So we have, for example, in the essential credential problem we have right now, it's only half the set, right? The same 40 players for the now and the future sheets. And for the future, we have four sheets. I, I got a one future sheets maybe uh, five years ago. Like, um, so I also kind of just take it off from the market. No one even knows the, about it. Is that the rare, <laughs> it's that the rarer one? You have the rare- No, no, no the same, same, same version. Oh, same you, have the, you have the same one that I do? Yeah. Oh, I did. But it's, it's, on, it's on the eBay. Uh, I think if what point is still functioning, then you can see it kind of, it was offered there. At that time, I was already keen, keenly aware that I need to take it off. Otherwise, there will be like sheet card version popping up. But I never even show it off because, yeah, I don't re regard it as a kind of a sort of a collectible in some sense. It's more like protecting the market. And also I bought a lot of uh, sheet card already, but unnumbered version mm. so that people couldn't uh, step on it. Uh, but those are sell really cheap. So it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, so there aren't a ton of sheets out there. So only maybe two sheets or three sheets, right? In this case, only two sheets we have seen uh, accounted for that can be out there, out there in the wild, right? Because all the others either are secured by us or they don't just don't exist. Right. For the now sheets, only one. Now sheets is more problematic because the same 40 players consists of the more rare version, right? But only one sheet is ever being accounted for. I got it. So you got it. This is protected. Yeah. Well, so you know, from that perspective, the market is not overwhelmed by those redundancies. So mm -hmm. people shouldn't be worried too much about it. And if you do research, by research, I mean you go to those big collections or some online kind of showcase or like albums, you put uh, several different images from different sources right together. And then the, the one you're interested in on eBay or in auction house, and you do some comparison analysis. I think I suggest you focus on the serial number to compare 
whether uh, they are kind of consistent with each other because you want your control to be from several different sources, right? So uh, that provides you a balanced control and then you pitch that against this new one. If they all belong to the same kind of style, then that's one like kind of safe peace of mind you have. And also you should be aware of um, the card conditions. For example, essential credential should have chippings in this 9798, right? They rarely come um, like long, really perfect, but somehow curly edges, then that's a problem. Yep. Like that. And also provenance, you should see, okay, this seller, um, you should look like uh, provenance means that you, whether you can establish this card is legit from this collection, either trace back all the ownerships or this is a big collection or he seems to be a guy supported from somewhere. So that this kind of things are very valuable. You should be part of the equation, right? You can yeah. chase things. Provenant, provenance is so important. I, I only own two original cards from, from the set. It's a, a Carl Malone future and a John Stockton now. And they both came from the same collector in Utah. They had them since you know the early 2000s or whatever. And that's as good as it gets. You know, and I mean, as good as it gets is getting it from the pack. But, but most of us don't have, you know, most, you're not going to have all the cards from the pack. You're not going to have more than a couple from the, from, from the packs just because they're, just because they're that rare. I also want to add real quick to your, your talk about the serial numbers. So, you know, I, without saying everything that you can look at at the serial numbers, I would, I would highlight a few things. Number one, look at the font. Number two, look at the placement. And when I say placement, I mean, where is the whole of that sort of like typing on the card? Number three is look at the space between the numbers. Number four is look at how they're aligned and compare that to how, you know, regular copies are aligned. And what Spino said is about looking at other great collections. I've looked at, I've looked at Nat's Flickr. I don't even know how many times, right? And I've looked at your stuff. I don't know how many times because it's important to have a good rec- a good understanding of like, okay, what is, what is their copy look like? Not that, you know, Nat's or, or Spino's collections are, you know, the, always the, the perfect ones, but they're far better than just an average card that you might see out there on the internet. So, you know, all of those things combined, look at the, look at the slant, you know, the, the number out of that, that number in between the two numbers, look at that, look how long it is. Look at, look at its, you know, angle. And then really like line up those numbers against other card, cards that are normal um, how evenly they're sort of like placed compared to the nor- normal ones, all of that stuff that all takes time. And, and it's like anything else, like it, you've, you've got to really put some time into it to sort of understand it. It's been over about out of time. Um, but I wonder if there's any other sort of parting, parting things that you want to talk about on this topic before we go. Right. Uh, can I quickly add to what you just said? I think, um, among all the things you said, I think the placement of the serial is not indicative of it being a problematic. Mm. I've seen it uh, being all over the place, right? And also even, <laughs> um, for example, the serial number, you have a, some number out of some number, right? Both of the numbers could ha- hold in the different horizontal lines, but each group should be well said. Uh, of the same same line. I think that's from my experience because I do see some sometimes like for example PMG Green they have the first uh, like a zero something of a hundred or something. Both of the numbering are of different lines, horizontal lines, but the the, the group are of the same line. So like if um, it's ninety three out of a hundred, the ninety and three, the nine and three should be aligned, and the hundred should um, be aligned. But that doesn't mean that they're both aligned together, yeah, both groups. Right. Are and also the positioning doesn't, it's not a, a indicative of it's being problematic. But as you said, the, the spacing is, it's fixed, right? If you yeah. have a group squished together and they separate out, they, they are definitely problems. And also the, I rarely see the foil stamp being tilted a little bit. I rarely see that. Mm. I think uh, for, for the one I have a three posts on Instagram right now, and one of them has a tilted version, so that that's a problem. But I think saying, the most are important you saying thing, tilted? Are you saying tilted version? 
Yeah, I'm seeing the serial number for your stamp being uh-huh. tilted within that box, right? They have yeah. a, like kind of a light box there. I never see that in the real version. Got it. So you see that, that you have to be a little bit cautious. But I think the still, I think the the most important is the font. The scammer never gets the right for the font, and it's not even closed so far because people would would think, okay, in the current technology, right, you should be able to replicate anything. Hard. But actually, because we have a very tiny card and very tiny things, right, and we look at the scan, which is blown up really big, but in the card, it's really small, and the way you stamp it, it could be of different pressure or different ink flow, right? So, and also they think they get it right, but actually not. So you have to, I think it's important to, to know this. As a collector, you have to be able to tell the differences. I think good collector should be a authenticator or knowledgeable guy about the item you collected, right? I think it's, 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 it's a fun process and also it's important process. You shouldn't rely on a third party to tell whether it's correct or not. Right? You should be totally. able to, but you can always check with another person, but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, to say they are, they are consistent, but it's easy to say why it's different from the real one, right? It's hard to, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's Couple. important to... Mm-hmm. A couple of years ago, I reached out to you and asked if there was any chance in the world that you would be willing to trade your one of your Kobe Bryants, because you have three of the eight Kobe Bryants. And I knew that the answer would be no, but I had to try because it's really like a dream card. And what I don't think a lot of people would 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 expect is the one that I would want from, from anybody, the one that I would have liked to try to get from you is the one that was graded the longest ago in a really old Beckett case, because to me, that is one of the best things in the world. When you have a card that has been, that's graded again, Beckett shows you the date, the card was graded. You can see when it was graded. You can see you know how that would compare to like the, the bankruptcy. And um, some of my favorite cards were graded prior to the bankruptcy because, and that's fantastic because you know, like this didn't come from a replacement. This came out of the pack. And I don't think that's a piece that people understand as well as, you know, as well as they should like, and I by the way, this isn't just, this isn't just about FLIR. Like this is about tops. This is about upper deck. We've seen over the course of the last few years, as you pointed out, as the hobby has changed, we've seen tops cards. We've seen upper deck cards that have come out without stamps, without serial numbers. And yeah. guys, there, there are people who are motivated to trick you and to try to take your money and you shouldn't be scared. You know, like Spino said, I don't think you should be scared. I think what you should do is do a lot of research and, and prepare, you know, so that when you, you know, when you see a card that pops up for sale, you say, okay, how do I know that this card is real? How can I tell that this, that this card wasn't, you know, cut from a sheet and, and, and changed afterwards? Well, for me, one of the coolest things is when you can find a card that was graded prior to those uncut sheets getting out into the hobby, because that gives you really a, a, a good assurity. So your your Kobe that's a seven and a half, just know that's my that's my when 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 you're writing up your will and you're thinking of your good friend Adam, which I know you won't be thinking about with your with your will, but that's that's the one that I look at and I go, that's the I just love that card for that reason. Right. Let me let me quickly um, supplement what you just said. Um, for example, Upper Deck has a backdoor copy, right? They they don't go bankrupt yet, but they have a backdoor copy, for example, for 97, uh, 99, 2000, SPX Spectrum, right? They have right. sheets of that, which uh, puzzled the collector for a long time, but it's very easy to tell. And also um, for tops, for example, we have um, unembossed refractor, right? Those kind of things like this. Also, um, backdoor copy. Even for Exquisite, I think especially in 2004, 2005, they have unnumbered card. Like for example, sure. um, Kobe, right? <laughs> Emblem endorsement and other things. So those, it's not a specific to a FLIR and Skybox. And another thing you mentioned uh, about, I think people these days try to maximize the value, right? They try to bump the card 
For example, if it's PGS graded, they try to bump the sub to, to make it more attractive. But in the process of that, you, you just kill the, the, the provenance, right? The right. thing you just said, you uh, change some things definitively graded like many years ago, probably prior to the bankruptcy and to a recent date. <laughs> at the expense of just incre increase the sub by no, no 0.5. I think I don't really like that. And also- I Couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah, and also PSA slab, right? They don't have grading date associated to it, but the version of the PSA slab, slab yeah. can locate you back to a certain era, right? Which years they're using this slab. And the people like to reholder them in the current slab and will think they will bring more money, but also damage the provenance. I think people should value the provenance more than just a little bit extra with the new kind of slab or new bump. The yeah, thing I think that's, that's totally overlooked at this point. You and I you and I could talk about this forever. We probably will, but um, I've got to follow up on that too. Um, the PSA holders are tricky because some of the older holders have been replicated so well that you see a newer holder and you feel more confident that, that the holder is real. And so, you know, that's, a, that's, that's problematic because there's, there's sort of incentives in either direction, but with Beckett, I could not agree with you more seeing, um, I'll give you an example, a personal example. One of my very favorite cards in my collection is, you know what I'm going to say? It's a Kobe Bryant autograph patch card out of upper deck. Um, Kobe Bryant has 24 uh, autograph patch cards from 2000. That's the first year that he had autograph patches. And mine is easily the worst because it's a plain white patch, but I love it because it was actually graded basically the year after it came out upper deck um, along the way has had several cards from that era that were patches that got out through the back door. Some are numbered, some aren't, but this card is numbered by hand. So it's not hard for somebody to just put out of eight on it. Right. Um, Ultimate collection has the same thing from 2000 where some of those patches got out unnumbered. And I've seen, I think four of them over the years. This is really like an important thing to understand because just because you see a card that's numbered out of eight, it doesn't mean that it's doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's wrong either. You just you have to be aware that those things exist. You can pick it up by looking at the pop report sometimes. Sometimes Beckett will give you some additional details, but that that I could go on and on about that. The key that's really important to recognize there is my 2000 upper deck autograph patch of Kobe Bryant out of eight. It was graded in 2001 or 2002. <laughs> I think it was December of 2001, if I remember right. It doesn't get better than that. I know it's real. I know it's just as it should have been, and it hasn't been altered. And somebody else who has one that's from later, like there's not that same, there's not that same level of confidence. And so having said that, you can't ever be, you know, you know, you can't put everything on it because a lot of those cards didn't get graded back then, but it's a component that should be considered more in the provenance of the card and uh spin we could talk on this forever what what final thoughts do you have before we go okay um yeah so i, I think we we should to wrap it up we, we we talked about this kind of bankruptcy sheet cut version right of the cards and so we, we should probably just to give a quick summary like what we have we have pack pool version, which is preferred version, right? Which is what it should be, right? The card produced from mystery pack, uh, randomized. Um, but then we have uh, the bankruptcy sheet card version, which is uh, introduced into the market because <laughs> of the situation. The liquidation happens. Um, people just want to extract extra money and some people like to have certain cards, right? Um, I, I saw some super collector, they collect tactical version, bankruptcy version, everything. So it's kind of to complete their collection somehow. So those, so that's one one version. And also there's the bankruptcy Shika version, but with um, artificial aftermarket stamp, stamp on it, right? That's the thing we addressed today. But there is also, um, but those two cards are real cards. They are produced by the original manufacturer. They were 
as opposed to reserved for replacing uh, the damaged part, but somehow get out, right? Uh, and now there's also completely reproduction by the scammers. So there are several categories of cards and we address the bankruptcy version. And uh, for me, I think the bankruptcy version she cut without zero number is still collectible. It should sell a tiny fraction of the pack put version. But if you introduce full stamp, it's kind of tampered with, right? Yeah completely destroyed its collectability, but somehow, as you mentioned, some collectors still want it because they couldn't get a hold of the, the Pepco version. But at, a much, at, a much lower, at a much lower value than the real thing. Right. You people. should be fully aware of what you're doing, right? Getting in, when you buy it, then it's no problem. And then sort of complete reproduction, it's just complete fraud. We shouldn't touch any of that, right? So that's what, <laughs> take away maybe for the discussion today yeah. and uh, if you in doubt you can always reach out reach out to us and also to research research is not too difficult you just pull out some comparison images from different collections and then compare with the one you are chasing and try to do some analysis and if you cannot completely decide you just send it to us and then we can help out and I think it's it's a step which is essential for serious collectors. I think <laughs> it's essential credential. <laughs> yes, that essential to add you to your credential being a serious collector. I guess I, I think that's a perfect place to leave it with with Spino making a pun about what's essential <laughs> um, in in the situation. I I the last thing that I would just add is that this isn't new. This has been going on for a really long time. Uncut sheets aren't new um, and and people taking them and trying to make a card look like it's totally original. Um, yeah. It's not new. It's total. It's, it's, very, it's very limited also. It's not uh, overwhelmingly no. out there, right? It's very no, there's few. only a few. It's not like there's yeah. hundreds of sheets out there. There's a few. And that's, <laughs> yeah. and that's why we... I think right into it is very slow, uh, very low, right? So yeah. that's you're, a real story. You're, exa you're exactly right. But... But it's not new, and and I think the thing that's that's true today, like it was true five years ago, is that the fact that these that these exist, and that it it gives some intrigue to the cards. I think it's beneficial to the market for the cards because what I think it does is it lends it lends itself to people actually doing what you just said, real research, becoming really familiar with the cards and with the sets. And uh, makes you love them and appreciate them more, especially when you find one and you go, "There we go, that was the right one right there." And mm -hmm. um, you know, I think yeah. I thank you, Spino, for taking the time with us today. Um, this has been super enjoyable. It's certainly our longest episode of the show yet, but I think people will really like it. And uh, again, I encourage everybody to follow Spinatron on Instagram. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either one of us. And until next time, happy collecting. <laughs>